Hey, you folks, Quilly Keen here. I got an email today from subscriber H12L asking for advice on how to play Austria. Uh, now, I haven't played a full game as Austria yet myself, and we still certainly don't have time to add a Let's Play to it to this calendar as is, but we can spend a video talking about what what your starting situation is as Austria and how you might want to proceed. This is going to be, you know, an advanced player can basically like take over all of Europe and half of Asia playing as Austria because they're very powerful, but that's not what we're really going to focus on here. We're going to focus on the sort of beginner thing and how to play Austria sort of the way it was meant to be played by the game designers. It's meant to be played as a relatively uh, diplomatic and reactive kind of nation. It's not your job to actively go out and conquer things as, as you might on some other countries. Um, instead, you're looking for situations to come up that you can really take advantage of. So, that you can't talk about Austria without talking about the Holy Roman Empire. So we're going to start by talking about that. The HRE is in the area that today we basically think of as, as basically Germany, more or less. Okay? And this is all land that is controlled by the emperor, the, em the Holy Roman Emperor. Now, at the start of the game, that starts off being you. You are the emperor. You happen to be the, the king of Austria, and you happen to be the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire at the same time. And as Austria, it's actually relatively easy to keep that under control. So how does it work? First of all, there are electors here. At any given time, there are seven electors, and they will choose someone to vote for. Now, Every time the emperor dies, these people will vote on who will become the next emperor. What you really want to do is ensure that you keep at least, I'd say at least three of these guys at any given time voting for you. It's possible uh, that all four of the others might vote for someone else, but that's pretty unlikely that they'll all get together on the same side. So as long as you keep really good relationship with at least three electors, they will keep voting on you. So if you do mouse over their shield, they will tell you exactly uh how much they like you. There's a few different uh, ways to look at it. Here we can, if we mouse over the number, so right now we are ahead by 36 points, and it will show you how much they like absolutely everyone else. And if we mouse over the shield itself, it will tell you why they like us and also why they like the person in second place. This becomes particularly important when they don't like you because you can see, oh, you got a minus 75 because of this, you know, some rivalry or, or unlawful territory or aggressive expansion or, you know, some other kind of nonsense like that. So you really have to keep an eye on these relationships and stay friendly with these electors so that you stay in control of the HRE. What does it give you from being the ruler? Well, it gives you more manpower, more force limit, and more prestige. Now that's at the start. Later on, you will be passing imperial reforms. So the very first one here, the, uh, the Reich's reform, the emperor, well, actually everyone, both the emperor and the members get 2% cheaper building costs. That, that's good. We also all get 2% cheaper technology costs. That's also nice. And the emperor gets extra prestige, which is quite nice. As you continue to go down this tree, again, it sort of generally improves the situation for everyone in the HRE, but it starts to become more and more and more powerful for just the emperor, him or herself, leading to all the way at the very end where you unite, you unite the entire HRE into one giant country. And that's really your thing as Austria. That's why you don't have to be sort of actively claiming territory. Theoretically, you could do this perfectly diplomatically. And all of a sudden, everything you see here in green would become Austria. And that's pretty damn good. Um, actually, would it say Austria? Would it say HRE? It might say that and probably still have a decision to form Ber uh, Germany or, or something of that nonsense. But, you know, so that's the thing. The, the Holy Roman Empire is really important. Now, the way you pass a reform is you have to get the princes to vote for it. If you mouse over here, nine people are for it and 40 are against. These are the princes down here. They're not electors, but they will choose whether to support reforms or not. Now, the more imperial authority you get, which is right over here, the more of the princes will flip over. You need a certain amount of this. General, I, I, I'm, there, there's various numbers and things, but you know, as this goes up, more princes will support it. And then when you pass a reform, it you spend your authority to pass that reform. But generally speaking, that's what you're trying to do. So um, you can be friends with princes and it might increase the chance that they would support it. But more than anything, you're just going to be trying to work on increasing the imperial authority. And if you mouse over this number, it tells you what you gain imperial authority for. Honoring the calls of members. So it's possible from time to time, let's say uh, Burgundy, who is not part of the HRE. Technically, they have, they have provinces 
these stripy provinces here are part of the Holy Roman Empire, the provinces themselves, but the nation of Burgundy is not. That's why it's striped instead of being solid green. And what's the difference? Might be even easier to see over here with um, with Venice, right? So all four of these provinces are considered to be part of the empire, but they belong to Venice, and Venice itself is not part of the empire. And the reason is, is this. If you click on a province, you can mouse over this icon. It says, hey, this, this province is part of the HRE. But Venice's capital, Venezia, is not and that means that the nation of venice is not part of the hre and what's interesting about this is it actually gives you all sorts of really easy ways to declare war on them we don't actually have the uh, the cb yet because i believe we need more imperial authority let me check here um ah here the very first decision calls for the rights reform it gives casus belli on non-members holding imperial territory. So a perfect example of that would be Italy, because they have four provinces that belong to the empire, but they themselves are not a member of the empire. So you pass that first reform, you get free CBs on Venice to claim all of this stuff. And frankly, your HRE members will quite like that uh, a lot if you do that. So same thing with Burgundy. Now, if on the flip side, if you happen to be playing, let's say you were playing Venice, and you wanted to become part of the HRE um, personally, as Venice, you can click this button here to add this province to the HRE. Now, it's tricky because, um, well, let's say there's a better example. Let's say you're Bohemia and you take Poznan over here from uh, Poland, okay? So Bohemia is a member of the HRE. Poznan is not part of the HRE. But if you claim it here as Bohemia, you would be able to click this button and add this prov province to the HRE. And actually, the, the emperor would like that because I believe it would increase their imperial authority if that happens. Um don't quote me on that. Provinces joining the empire. Yeah, whenever a province joins the empire, I be even from someone else, I believe the current emperor will gain imperial authority. So there's that. And then, um, as Venice, who is not an HRE member, they can try to do that to their capital. Depending on their size and depending on how much Austria likes them, they can add their capital to the HRE and then you will become a member of the HRE. It's a thing that can happen. Poland can do it as well uh, through a little bit of trickery. If they get friendly enough and maybe they like sell off a province to one of their vassals, then they can join the HRE because they'll be small enough to do that. Anyway, um, so we talked about the CBs there. So what else do we get? Uh, oh, I should also point out if we... The loss and gain. Yeah, we're. Oh, I want to talk about honoring calls of members. So, if someone from a outside the HRE declares war on anyone inside the HRE, you as the emperor will get a call to war. It's your job to defend the entirety of the empire, even if it's someone who doesn't like you, right? Even if you're you're not friends with someone, you might get one of these calls to war. If you turn it down, you will lose imperial authority. If you accept then it's great and everyone will love you. Uh, furthermore, if someone happens to annex a nation, let's say that um, uh, Bohemia over here annexes the Platinate, okay? That's bad, but it would give you a CB to go and like, hey, Bohemia, you're not supposed to own this place. Um, at least it should give you a CB. I, I might be misremembering, don't quote me on it 100%. But the idea is if you then go to war against Bohemia, in the peace deal, rather than taking land yourself, you can actually force them to release a nation, release the Platinate back in as an independent nation. And when that nation rises up from the ashes like a phoenix, which is the, the quote that the game gives you, then you will gain imperial authority and everyone will love you. And that's generally what you're going to try to do with Austria. You're going to respond to events and keep trying to do things that increase your authority. You want to make sure that you don't go into a bunch of pointless wars and lose a bunch of manpower because you want to be able to respond to these wars that could a either cost you imperial authority or could give you imperial authority. You want to keep taking advantage of that. Um, so uh, going on the offensive a lot doesn't really make a lot of sense, especially since you have such great diplomacy, you can actually tend to vassalize a lot of people, offer vassalization to people and do that. So this brings us back to the HRE stuff. Uh, vassalizing electors is not really something you can do. Okay, actually, if we click on Bohemia and we go to offer vassalization, um, no, I was pretty sure it just wasn't allowed. I thought you couldn't vassalize diplomatically an elector. I may be wrong. Uh, I think you can do it in war, although that does tend to make everyone a little bit cranky. Um, the nice thing, though, if you do vassalize an elector, they will always vote for you. 
Also, if you vassalize a prince, they will support your reforms. And that's the thing you can do. But again, you can do it diplomatically. Now, it is worth noting you have a limited number of diplomatic relation slots. Okay, they uh, they get used up. You, only, you also only start off with two diplomats. However, there's quite a few different ways that you can increase this as you go on. Generally speaking, the first idea you're going to go for as Austria will be diplomatic ideas over here. It's actually quite nice because um, obviously to level up the diplomatic ideas, you have to spend a diplomatic power, but you don't really care about a navy. You're not going to have much of a navy as Austria. So the fact that your navy is going to be, you know, technologically backwards is going to be fine. You're not going to do any colonization as Austria. So that's okay. You can actually afford to like, you could stay at diplomatic technology three for most of the game. And it wouldn't really bother you that much, which is kind of an interesting thing. So it becomes very obvious that you're going to grab diplomatic ideas as your very first thing, which gives you more diplomats, which are good because you're going to want to improve relations with a lot of people. Keep your relations with electors very high, plus keep relations with... Um, with princes very high in preparation of diplomatically vassalizing them. And then once you've diplomatically vassalized them, you can also consider diplomatically annexing them. It can still make people a little bit cranky, but it's definitely a possibility. Uh, do note that the uh, if you do annex a prince, then that's less, there are fewer princes around. And actually, when the number of princes drops below a certain point, well, you actually the HRE kind of stops functioning, but you can see here that based on the number of rulers in the empire, you get different benefits. And what you want to do is you want to try to keep the other nations in the HRE small. If Bohemia all of a sudden starts to eat up a bunch of other nations, you're going to have to go to war with Bohemia and force them to release those nations. A, it's good for your imperial authority, but B, it keeps your your um, your challengers very, very tiny. That's, that's really your goal there. Uh, going back to the ideas, the other important thing that you get in diplomatic ideas, uh, fabricating claims, eh, Diplomatic relations, so you can have more. You can have more vassals, more alliances, more royal marriages, very important. Um, and the other one, improved relations boost is quite nice. Diplomatic reputation increase is nice. It's not as useful as it used to be. Diplomatic reputation used to uh, speed the time to annex a vassal diplomatically, um, and it no longer does that. Now it costs you diplomatic points, which again, you're not going to cry about. But diplomatic reputation is still good for getting other people to agree to doing things on your behalf. Um, and then flexible negotiations yeah, it can help you if you want to do war stuff, but it's not that critical. And then the uh, lower stability impact from diplomatic actions, I believe it will let you break royal marriages without losing any stability and also helps if you're breaking truces or something. Not that you should really do that, but it gives you some options. The real things are the extra diplomat and the extra diplomatic reputation. But also, you, you want to go through ideas as quickly as possible simply because every three ideas, you will unlock a new national idea that we haven't talked about yet. A, you get some extra prestige and you get better relations over time. That's fine. And if you complete everything, you increase your chance of a new era. Yeah, okay. But here Here's the important stuff. Imperial ambition. You get 10% more imperial authority whenever you do something. That's great. Uh, fort defense is actually, it's nice, but it's not what we're here for. Uh, fugger banking gives you uh, inflation reduction and lowered interest. Why is inflation reduction really important for us? Well, we have a gold mine in Tyrol. Gold gives us huge amounts of cash, right? It shows up in the list here. Look at this. This one province in Tyrol is giving us almost as much money as our entire tax base put together. That's great, but gold gives you inflation. So you are going to quite appreciate the fact that this reduces your inflation. It's also quite likely that you might end up going with uh, economic ideas? Question mark? Here we go, inflation reduction. I don't remember. Uh, reduce inflation costs, not quite the same. Yeah, so you might end up doing uh, the the National Bank for the inflation reduction. But yeah, so, um, oh, National Ideas, right. So we get some inflation reduction there. But what's amazing is the next one. Habsburg dominance plus five, oh, that's not what I was thinking, plus five diplomatic reputation. Again, reputation is nice, helps people to see things your way. Doesn't help with annexing vassals, so it's not quite as good as it used to be. Um, the, what I actually wanted is this one over here, plus one diplomatic relations. Again, you're going to want a lot. In fact, you're probably going to be over your max of diplomatic re uh, relations quite frequently, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, as long as they're, they're good and useful. Then more reinforcement speed. Um, religion. As Austria, you almost certainly want to stay very resoundedly Catholic um, as, as much as possible. And when the reformation, start, reformation starts to happen, people will start flipping over to Protestant or Reformed or something like that. And one of the things you can do as the emperor 
is, oh, it's not in the options, is you can ask them, you can insist that they flip back to the one true faith, which is whatever you're running. So, you know, theoretically Catholic. Uh, you will lose imperial authority if they change to a different religion, and you will gain it back if you convince them to flip sides. Now, if you do insist, it does make everyone a little bit cranky, uh, and it's possible that they won't agree in which case you may have to go to war. And another idea that might be good may be religious ideas over here, just to make it easier to convert things and give you some easier CBs. That can definitely be the case if the Ottomans start to push in this way, but that's more of a late game uh, kind of thing. So yeah, stay Catholic, try to grab a bunch of uh, cardinals, it's very helpful. Also, if you become the courier controller, you get the plus one diplomat, which is hugely, hugely awesome. Um, and uh, do keep trying to boost your HRE relations. Uh, let's talk about first moves, actually. There's some interesting things to do with marriage. Again, with Austria, their motto was, you know, let other people go to war, we're going to marry and do that. Um, so let's talk about marrying, okay? Marrying improves relationships, but it also gives you a way to spread the Habsburg name to different thrones, and that can give you the chance to get a personal union. In fact, some great early targets for that could be Hungary, which starts off with a regency council. If you do get to marry with them, now right here they did start with a rivalry, and I think that's going to be the case as of uh, 1.6, which is kind of unfortunate since the new rival system. But if you can manage to get a royal marriage with Hungary, then uh, if they're in a regency council, they might get your heir, or maybe they're guaranteed to get your 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 heir. I think the Landfriedens is the same thing as an interregnum, which you can see in Poland here. So I think it might that might be a possibility in Bohemia as well. I'm not sure. But yeah, spread your royal marriages around and you'd be actually kind of surprised as to what you can what you can pull off. Um, you can if someone has your your house, if they're Habsburg and they die without an heir, uh, depending on your prestige and different things like that, you can look it up on the wiki. It's kind of wonky. You might automatically and for free fall into a personal union with someone, which means they're basically like your vassal. Every, it's possible that they might break out of the, the personal union, um, but given enough time, not only will you keep them as kind of a super vassal, they might per, they might automatically become integrated into your uh, country. Also, after 50 years, you can just start the process as well. And that becomes very, very good. But just having that extra vassal around is, is really good and powerful. Um, so, you know, do get those marriages. You actually start off with two quests early on that are quite handy, protecting the ancestral land and securing the imperial border, both of which want you to have a royal marriage, either with Bavaria or with Burgundy. You also need to get the relationship up to over 100 to complete this quest. But if you get the, the royal marriage, you can usually follow that up with an alliance, and that's usually going to be good enough to get you at or near... Um, uh, a 100 depending on you know other factors and you can always improve relations if you need to get over there both of them give you an extra 50 diplo or administrative powers and they're both quite useful to have playing as austria there's hopefully going to be an event where the king of burgundy dies in which case you'll inherit quite a bit of land for free it'll just become austrian and some of it might become french it's, it's kind of wonky there uh, if you don't get at that event then you actually got some bad luck but usually that event will fire and then you will get a bunch of free land over here, which is quite nice. It might put you into conflict with France, which honestly is probably your number one source of opposition, ignoring internal wars. If you let Bohemia or Bavaria or someone like that become too powerful, then you might have some issues inside of here. Uh, but theoretically, you should be able to keep knocking them down. It's a big blobby France that is going to be the big problem. So alliances... Ideally, if you can get something with Castile, it's nice. England might be helpful, depending on how they do. England tends to be quite weak early on, I find, but then they do start to scale up. But those are sort of like very, very um, useful allies. You might be able to do something with Poland uh, as well. Um, usually Denmark, there's going to be some conflict there, so that might be an option, but you never know. You might be able to get an independent Sweden on your side once that happens. Play it by ear. Muscovy could also be a, a great ally if you pull in a Lithuania end up being a thorn in your side, for example. But let's say you have to fight France. How do you do that? You fight in the mountains. The mountains are like the greatest goddamn thing you will ever, ever get to experience playing as Austria or against Austria. The idea is you sit in the mountains, the AI will still try to attack you there, and you're going to get massive, massive defensive boosts from fighting in the mountains. It is truly an incredible thing. It's unbelievable. And you can abuse the AI quite a bit with this. You can take your army, split off like three dudes, put those dudes in Tyrol, for example, which is a great source of mountains. If we take a look, Tyrol is 100% mountains. Trent is 100% mountains. Lienz is 99.4%. Uh, Carton does drop off quite a bit. 83% uh, here in uh, Steiermark. Um, and, and quite a few of the other uh, provinces here have a lot of mountains as well. Put your dudes in the mountain. Put this like three stack there and then take the rest of your army, split them in half, go to Trent and Lienz, and just wait there. 
you will likely bait the AI into attacking you in Tyrol, and then you instantly just move your rest of your army in there, and you force the AI to fight a big war with terrible terrain, as long as you stay on the defense. Um, you got to make sure that you don't put too few people in here, that they get killed right away, and then you'll arrive and you'll be the attacker into the mountains, which would be very bad. Um, but there can be a really insane ratio here, um, it, de depending on technology levels and whatever. Three people could easily hold off 10 or 15 guys long enough for you to reinforce. If we're talking about like a 60 stack, then, you know, just put 10 guys there. Put, put in like a fifth of whatever they have around that'll be enough to convince the ai to attack but your guys will be able to defend long enough to be able to reinforce relatively easily do make sure that your army composition is sensible um you know you don't want to overdo it on cavalry once you get cannons they're going to be uh really really good actually because the uh, the mountains are so narrow you can sometimes get away with having more cannons than actual infantry in your front line but generally speaking you as a general rule of thumb, you want to have enough infantry to cover all of your artillery. Uh, and usually you want m a little bit of extra infantry. Oops, accidentally I paused. A little bit of extra infantry because uh, some of them will die quite quickly in the battle. And you don't want to expose your back line of your artillery. But that doesn't apply as much in the mountains because they're so narrow that usually it'll be like five infantry actually fighting and then like 15 cannons in the back actually firing the, the those lines of battle things are a little bit fuzzy but generally speaking try to have a relatively balanced army and don't overdo it on cavalry uh certainly so that's it you can you can reliably fight france if they if if they will come to you if they will fight you in the mountains over here you are going to be set uh but the other way goes around as well never ever attack into the mountains or you're going to have massive modifiers against you and you'll be surprised at how bad of a battle you will lose uh let's say you decide to go and conquer switzerland for example notice that uh grabundan over here is 98 percent mountains you don't want to attack into it you want to you want to get there first you want to like have units here declare war when this is empty and then move in your troops right away so you're standing there same thing applies to waldstadt and i think wallace as well 85% mountains and still 13% hills as well, which can offer some extra benefits and defenses. So there you go. I think Austria is actually a great newbie nation in that you don't have to be really active and, and do too many tricky things, but you really have to cast a wide net with your diplomacy and you have to be ready to respond to enemy actions against the HRE. You have to think of the HRE here as this will all eventually be your territory and you'll be damned if anyone decides to threaten it. Um, going to war against things outside your territory is great, and also, if you do take anything outside of here, make sure, after you claim it, to click this button to add the provinces to the HRE. It'll just make you uh, more and more and more powerful, it does all sorts of great uh, Casas Belly stuff, and it's just, generally speaking, very, very, very awesome. Um, there you have it. And you know what? I think it's wrong. If Bohemia adds a province, I don't think it gives imperial authority to Austria. I think it's only if you do it yourself, but it becomes quite good. Uh, a good early war target is Venice, but keep your manpower up. You always want to have some sitting around because you never know when you will be called into a defensive war and you really want to respond to them. It's okay. If, you know, if you're sort of capped on manpower, then that's a good time to maybe declare a small war, right? But if you're at half or lower, just sit tight. Let your forces replenish themselves. In case you get called into a defensive war, you want to be able to jump in. Um, if ever you're zero manpower, it might be uh, justified to not join in a defensive war. But generally speaking, you're going to want to try to join whenever possible. Even if you're not active, you could join in something that's happening, you know, up here in Lorraine, but just sit in Tyrol. The AI may still come after you at some point, and at the very least, you, you vaguely answered the call, so it becomes kind of a thing. Uh, keep your prestige relatively high, especially with all your royal marriages. It'll increase the chance that awesome things happen, and uh, there you go. Austria is a very, very, very powerful nation. Play the diplomatic game, be reactive, and there you have it. Um, hopefully, you'll have a great time. See you next time, folks. Bye-bye.